we've made it to the end of the gender section, but we still have the sexuality section. So we're going to jump into a pretty brief section on sexual identity development. And so by sexual identity, what we're really talking about is who we are interested in having sex with, if anybody, as an adult. And so sexual identity starts off really basic and starts off pretty early in childhood. We're not going to talk about Freud's psychosexual development. We've definitely covered that enough in psychology. But what we're going to talk about is sexual attraction. And so sexual attraction starts off as early as young childhood, and it starts off as what we would call puppy love. And so puppy love is when a person may have crushes on someone, and it's not explicitly sexual yet. How these puppy crushes or puppy love starts off is a person is more drawn to someone. They're spending more attention on someone and they're admiring them. For kids, this may be they're watching someone on TV or they're watching even a cartoon character or they're watching a classmate and they may not feel anything sexual towards them, but they just like looking at them and they like admiring them and that person has their attention. So it's the idea that you might be watching a TV show and oh, this, this character really captivates me and I can't stop watching them. Now, obviously that may not necessarily be something sexual, it might just be an interesting, captivating character. But if it's not an especially captivating character and you just keep thinking about them, that may be that you're starting to get the groundwork to be attracted to them. So some kids that can remember as early as being five years of age and being somewhat mesmerized with a person or a character. And that really helped them to understand their sexual identity once they were an adult. We know the next stage from this is sort of status and affiliation. Not only do you want to admire the person from a distance, but you want to be associated with them. You want to hang out with them. You want to be with them and spend time with them. So if they're not a fictional character now, or if they're a fictional character, maybe you want to read all their books and watch all their movies. But if they're a real person, like a classmate, you just want to be with them. You want to play with them after school and you want to be associated with them and you find great comfort in that. And so you're seeking out companionship. And so how this really starts off in elementary school is kids get crushes on each other and they just, they want to be around each other. Being around each other brings them great comfort. And then as we move into adolescence, the exploration of sexual behaviors starts to emerge. When we're referring to sexual behaviors in adolescence, we're really talking about two main types. And that is self-exploration and partnered exploration. So self-exploration might start earlier than adolescence. In fact, as early as some toddlers and preschoolers, they might be just exploring their body and might be you know, poking and prodding at different parts. But we see this really start to increase once puberty is on the go. So puberty, uh, if you recall our physical development unit, menarche tends to happen at about 11 and a half years of age and see menarche tends to happen around 13 and a half years of age. So we especially think about boys who are experiencing semenarche around 13 years of age, they're experiencing probably a lot of masturbation. And so what's going on there is in order for them to ejaculate and reach semenarche, there's a lot of self-exploration, a lot of body stuff happening. And so it's very typical for boys to start to masturbate before semenarche and definitely once semenarche has started. And so that's the idea that it's ramping up and it's this really increased period of self bodily exploration and exploring what's happening during the self touching and orgasm and sexual arousal stages. For girls, menarche does not require self exploration as much other than putting in a tampon and things of that nature. And so masturbation for girls tends to not happen as early as masturbation for boys. It can, there's definitely a wide range, but we tend to see some girls don't actually start to masturbate until after they've had some partnered exploration. And so for partnered exploration, what we find is it start, starts off with mixed group dating. And so mixed group dating is pretty casual. What it is is a lot of kids that say they're each other's boyfriends or girlfriends or significant other, and they hang out together during free social time. And there may not be a lot of physical contact or physical exploration at this point in time, but it's more just affiliation based. So what happens is they might be boyfriend, girlfriend in name only, and they just kind of hang out together. Maybe they watch movies together, play video games together, and they'll be in a mixed gender group. This is really the first time we go back to the mixed gender groups. And since the idea of a group of guys, group of girls, or a group of girls, group of guys, they all kind of hang out together and they're all partnered in name, but name only. Eventually, and in gradual steps, there tends to be a little bit more exploration. And eventually by late adolescence, it's shifted from mixed group dating to intimate partner dating. And intimate partner dating now is when two adolescents, they are really focused on just them. And they like to see each other, just the two of them spend a lot of alone time together. And they start doing more physical exploration and experimentation with each other. 
And so this is the idea that they are more interested in doing all the basic kissing, petting, touching, and sexual activity with one another. And so this comes on gradually and we tend to see that by age 18, majority of adolescents have explored quite extensively in terms of their sexual behaviors. And with this experimentation comes the notion of understanding attraction. Attraction and behavior are not always synchronized. Sometimes somebody is attracted to someone, but it's not reciprocal, so they can't do anything with them. Or sometimes they're attracted to someone, but they're too nervous and they don't ask them out. Or sometimes they're attracted to someone and um, because it would be a same gender relationship, let's say they're too nervous to take that step in adolescence and they'll wait until they're in adulthood. But definitely in adolescence, we start to get a concept of our attraction. And attraction is extremely complex and fluid. What we know is over the duration of our lifetime, we might change in terms of the type of relationship we're looking for, whether it's casual or serious, short-term or long-term. We might also change in terms of the type of partner we want or type of partners we want. It might be that you're okay having many casual partners at one point in your life, and then eventually you want one monogamous partner, or maybe you want a partner of one type of gender at one point in your life and then you shift and you're more interested in other genders at other points in your life. So it can be very fluid. Much like our different spectrums for gender and gender expression and, and sex assigned at birth, we can see lots of spectrums associated with sexuality. And so it's important for us to go through and understand what these different spectrums are about. We're gonna start at the top. The first type of spectrum we're gonna talk about is the desire for partners. Maybe you have no desire for partners. Maybe you're low in both of these spectrums. Maybe you're the runaway bride and you're okay spending your life alone. Maybe you have a strong desire for one partner in particular, and that would be monogamy. This is the idea you want to have one romantic relationship and they're your everything. Or maybe you're not interested in that. Maybe you're interested in multiple relationships. Maybe you want to have someone who's a secondary or a primary partner. Maybe you want to have a couple casual partners. And polyamory can come in lots of different forms. And so you could have a combo of both. There might be some benefits to having one primary partner and a few on the side partners. Or maybe you want one and not the other. Then we have the desire for commitment. Some individuals, in order to become sexually engaged with someone, they have to have a certain level of emotional commitment. And so for some people, in order to take physical steps towards someone, they have to have the emotional commitment there. So do you require a lot of emotional commitment? Do you need to be in love, for instance, before you become physically intimate with someone? Other people may not feel that way. They might actually prefer for no commitment. They might actually prefer for things to be casual and no strings attached. So they may desire casual. Some people might be okay with either. Some people, again, might not desire either and they're okay being alone. Then we have who you are physically attracted to. By physical attraction, we're gonna define this as the sort of uh, in your loins attraction, something that's going to get you a physiological attraction to the person who's going to make you desire to have sexual physical encounters. And so are you physically attracted to women, to men, or to individuals of other genders? And so this is the idea, um, you might be high in three of these or low in all three or a mix. We could understand that a person who maybe is exclusively attracted to women and not attracted to men at all, or exclusively attracted to men and not attracted to women at all, or someone attracted to both, or anywhere in between. And that is different than emotional attraction. Emotional attraction might be hard for a lot of people to understand if a physical and emotional attraction always goes hand in hand. For some individuals, it doesn't go hand in hand. For some individuals, they don't feel the in your loin sexual attraction, but they may feel a romantic attraction where they love someone and maybe they wanna cuddle them, but that's the only physical thing they really wanna do with them. But they wanna be their companion and it's different than a friendship. It's romantic. It's they wanna be their everything and share that really intimate stuff with them. And so you could be emotionally attracted to women, to men, to people of other genders, and any combination of those three. And so we can see how attraction can be extremely complicated. It's not just straight or gay. And in fact, when we move over to talking about the labels, we can see how things can get really diverse. So when we think about the emotional commitment and if you're attracted to people of the same gender or other genders or you're emotionally or physically attracted, uh, I did my best here to put them in one sort of grid. And this grid can be confusing, so we're going to take our time and go through it. So in terms of sexuality labels, there's a lot of fluidity in sexuality. But because of political reasons, a lot of individuals choose to put a label on their sexuality. 
and the label can be very meaningful to them. And some of the labels individuals put on their sexuality is labels like straight. A straight person it would be a person who's mainly attracted to people of another gender. Another, another type of label people may choose to put on themselves is queer, gay, or lesbian. And these tend to be individuals who are attracted to individuals of the same gender. Then we have individuals that may choose labels like bisexual or pansexual. And this may be individuals who are attracted to individuals of multiple genders, at least two genders usually. Uh, usually their gender plus another one or any two genders. And then we have individuals that are not attracted to any gender whatsoever. They're not really feeling that physical or emotional attracted to anyone, and they may define themselves as asexual. You could sometimes have an emotional attraction if you're asexual, but not a physical one. And sometimes if you don't have a physical or emotional attraction, you may be called aromantic. And that's the idea, you also don't have the emotional attraction. So some people call themselves asexual aromantic or ace aero, and that means they don't have the physical or the emotional attraction. And then we have some individuals that don't really have the physical attraction unless they have the emotional attraction first, and they may be demisexual. Now these labels change all the time and they are something that's morphing constantly, so this video might become outdated eventually, but we're going to work our way through the grid here. Let's go down the first column and you might find it helpful if you could sort of cover up the other ones. If this was an animated PowerPoint, I tend to cover up the dials and make it look like a bit of a game show where the blocks rotate. If you are not attracted to the same gender, and you're also not attracted to people of a different gender, you may put a label on yourself such as asexual. That tends to be a common label for people in this group, but certainly not all people in that group use that label. If you're not attracted to the same gender, and you're emotionally attracted to people of different genders, but not particularly physically attracted to them, uh, then you might call yourself demisexual. That's what this flag indicates. And if you're not attracted to the same gender, but you're physically and sexually attracted to people of different genders, then you are probably straight or heterosexual. Now I'll move to the middle column here. If you're emotionally attracted to the same gender, but not physically, and you're not at all attracted to different genders, you might be demisexual and queer. So it might be the idea that you might be emotionally attracted to people of the same gender, and once you get that emotional attachment, maybe then you're interested in doing physical things. And you might be emotionally attracted to the same gender and emotionally attracted to different genders. And it's not really the physical stuff that comes for you, it's the emotional first. And it doesn't really matter what your partner's gender is. In that case, there's lots of different labels for this block, but one possible is panromantic demisexual. That's a mouthful, but it's the idea that you might be demisexual and pansexual where you're attracted to multiple genders, but you really have to have that emotional piece first. If you're emotionally attracted to the same gender and physically attracted to the different gender, some people would call that bisexual and some other people would call that pansexual. Pansexual and bisexual tend to be very related terms, but some people choose to distinguish them based on the fact that pansexual, it's about you're attracted to them regardless of their gender. So the regardless part might fit this one. So if you have the physical attraction uh, to people of the different gender and you can be emotionally, and then after the emotional, get the physical attraction to people of the same gender, you might be pan or pansexual. Now, if you're not attracted to different gender at all, but you're physically attracted and sexually attracted to people of the same gender, you might identify as queer, gay, or lesbian. If you're physically attracted to the same gender and emotionally attracted to different genders, again, you might be identified as either bisexual or pansexual. I put pansexual here because the emotional piece uh, might lend itself more to the regardless uh, part of the definition of pansexual. And if you're physically attracted to both people of the same and different genders, the most common label people tend to use for this is bisexual. Now, this can be really muddied, it can be really complicated, and one thing I really want to emphasize here is your sexuality label tends to be more political, and sexuality labels don't necessarily map on to your attraction and your behavior. They can actually be different. For instance, someone might use the label asexual even though they engage in sexual behaviors with a partner. Somebody might identify as gay even though once in a while they are attracted to people of a different gender. Some people might call themselves straight, even though once in a while, under a certain type of circumstance, they're attracted to people of the same gender. So people might use labels on themselves that don't completely map up with their behaviors and their attraction. And sexuality is really complicated in that way. A lot of young people are constantly trying to figure out if I'm attracted to this and this and this, what's the right label for me? And ultimately, the right label for you is one you feel comfortable with. 
And for many of us, the label that fits comfortable with us is no label at all, because sexuality is extremely fluid and extremely diverse, and we're still finding out a lot about it, especially as we become more open and more able to talk about it. Wow, we have reached the end of Unit 8, and that is the end of this course! Congratulations, you have made it to the end of developmental psychology. Well done.